The Late Night Lake Show podcast is sponsored by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the best legal way to play daily fantasy player props in states like California, New York, Texas, and more. You pick two to five players and an over under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times on any entry. The best part is you can mix players from different sports. You could take the over on LeBron combined with the under on Mahomes in the same entry. Prize Picks is the easiest way to play daily fantasy because it's just you versus the projected numbers just use our promo code lnls and any deposit you make can receive a hundred percent instant deposit match up to a hundred dollars so go support the brand and go win you some money it's the best of both worlds again use our promo code lnls all right y'all welcome to our first stop on our 23 24 nba season preview and we are landing in the land of the sun well by way of chicago i got my boy steven here who has been covering the phoenix suns for the last three seasons and like myself and late night lake show he is a uh, he's a transplant he's a chicago boy a fellow isu illinois state redbird uh, is in the building so really really appreciate having my guy steven stopping by to talk a little sons lakers with us steven what's the word my man how you doing man i'm, I'm blessed 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 how y'all feeling 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 good man, man. Getting ready for this season ramp up, bro. And I, you know, just looking at the rundown, and uh, yeah, it's been a pretty quiet last year for the Phoenix Suns, has it not? Not a lot of news, <laughs> not a lot of uh, updates. It's been a pretty chill franchise. <laughs> yeah, let me let me stop right there. So I think the Phoenix <laughs> Suns might be the only NBA franchise that has been in the headlines more than the Los Angeles Lakers the past two NBA seasons, from their NBA Finals appearance a few years ago, all the way up to getting rid of their owner, replacing him, adding one of the greatest players in the history of this league in Kevin Durant, then turning around and adding another dynamic all-star in Bradley Beal. And now we're sitting here still with rumors and decisions that the team is to make. So, I mean, let's just let's just dive into it, Stephen, man. You got, you got a lot on your plate with the Suns this season, from head coaching all the way down to roster construction. But I think the hottest news right now that we just want to get your take on is this whole Damian Lillard trade, right, bro? And, and not necessarily for the Suns to acquire Dame, but more so what it means for your big man and DeAndre Ayton and how he is now thrown back into the rumors and possibly being out the door. We're hearing names like Nurkic to be in an even swap. Just talk to me a little bit about what's going on with Ayton in Phoenix and if he's long to be on this roster come season opener. Well, the rumors, I'll just address that firstly. The rumors about Aiden and Nurkic being a clean, even swap is <laughs> that's that that's laughable for me. Uh just for somebody that watches like pretty much the entire league as much as possible. That is not a one for one swap that's beneficial for the Suns. Um, so I don't think because of that, I don't think it's realistic. It would be obviously an attachment to the Damian Lillard trade. So how they navigate those waters in terms of if they jump in and be a third or fourth team to facilitate the trade remains to be seen. But I feel like I've been in the um, other mindset that Aiden will only get traded in this off season, especially with Frank Vogel being in the mix, if it was for Miles Turner in some capacity. So if it's not for Miles Turner, so for example, in the trade with Dame, if they include Indiana and obviously Phoenix, it would be Aiden going to uh, probably to Portland Nurkish to Indiana, and then Turner to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I'm saying that's been of the mindset that I'm of. I just can't see them wanting Nurkic in the NBA where you have to have, to contend, you have to have a, fr a front court piece, especially especially specifically at center, that cannot get played off the floor defensively. Nurkic, right. is, Nurkic is a solid defender, don't get me wrong, but he doesn't have the scheme versatility that DeAndre Aiden brings, which is the ultimate asset he brings to the Suns. So you're not going to swap that out for a player who is not as good as Aiden is offensively and definitely isn't as effective in a playoff stage defensively for a liability potentially. So I just can't see that happening. Uh, so, yeah, I'm of the mindset that if Aiden is getting traded, it's going to be for Miles Turner in some capacity. 
It's funny you say that because I was actually tweeting about that not long ago that if they did move, it seems like they would take that shot for Miles Turner based on the roster construction, kind of like what they need. And you don't want to give up and not get back quality fit and player with reasonable age for a kid that as good as Aiden can be. And Aiden was a number one overall, right? Aiden was um, right. like, you yeah. just can't. That's basically asset mismanagement. You can't just give up something like that for a Nurkic who's not as good or as um, like he doesn't have the same pedigree and he has an injury history that yeah, Aiden does um, not have. Mm -hmm. yep. Like it just don't even, that don't even make sense. And I feel like one thing I'll say about the Suns is the, they made big moves, but the ancillary moves outside of that were done soundly as far as like, giving the minimum players the um, second year option. So it can almost be like equivalent to like a no trade clause. So they feel like those guys are, you know, a part of the team and included and not just like throwing in filler and we just bringing random guys in here. We can make sure that, you know, we possibly got plans for y'all next year if, you, if everything works out and y'all want to come back. So no, it, it's funny you said that about Nurkic though. We were definitely um, thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, it don't it don't make a lot of sense and i'm just i'm a little surprised that you uh you should nurture in the year of our lord or 2023, 2023 is getting thrown into trade rumors as a possible solution and a piece that frank vogel we know we know frank vogel well we know him like the back of our hands frankie smokes mm -hmm. if there's one thing that he's going to look for is a defensive by the big and you know all respects to the folks who cover the phoenix suns out there i think you had one radio guy calling uh nurkic a uh, defensive minded big and i almost pulled my hair out because i was like what what, what that we're, we're watching two different games if they, that's where we're at right now that would be a credit to chauncey billups for all of the zone defense that he was playing last season and things like that rather than nurkic being um even closer to the stratosphere of somebody like Rudy Gobert or any other Nick Claxton type big that you want to mention. So right. yeah, y'all y'all are right on par with that for sure. <laughs> Let's talk about the big acquisition of the offseason. So far, the, the biggest name uh that has moved teams uh this offseason, which is one Bradley Beal. Um this was a trade that happened kind of almost in silo. Um, it seems like the the Suns and the Wizards, we, they wanted to do right by Bradley Beal, and they took into account his options, and they shipped him over to play with Devin Booker and Kevin F. and Durant. So, you know, we're going to see how that looks out on paper, right? That should be a top-four team in, in the West. It all obviously rests on the shoulders of Kevin Durant's health, but this might be one of the first times, right, that KD can – take a back seat if he is hurt or banged up and there are multiple stars on the court you could look to Brooklyn and kind of point to that but there was what maybe 11 games that Harden exactly. um, Kyrie and KD all played together book is a relatively healthy one all 11 right? by the way if I'm not mistaken <laughs> you know what I'm saying man so KD's going to have that star support with him if and when he starts to get nicked up throughout the season he's 34 it's just bound to happen at this point in his career nonetheless Bradley Beal on both ends of the court provides an infusion of energy uh to this team and really makes them a championship contender I'm curious though between book and Beal and the departure of Chris Paul, how do you see the point guard position kind of shaking out this season? Well, considering that they didn't directly address it as far as getting somebody that's of the starting caliber at point guard, it's definitely going to be a by committee type of thing. You have three of the not just best um, just player types across the entire NBA on your roster, but you also have three players that can also initiate offense. So it doesn't have to be the Chris Paul type of, we know who's bringing it up the up the floor and who's setting up the table for everybody else. It's going to be KD sometimes initiating offense, which is going to look different than when Devin Booker is initiating offense, which all two are going to look different than when Bradley Beal is initiating offense. And I think that optionality and that unpredictability to your offense is going to put you in a position to consistently pull the strings of a defense because you're not going to treat a pick and roll to start the offense with 18 seconds left from Kevin Durant the same way that you're going to treat one from Bradley Beal or from Devin Booker. And in addition to that, when one of those two guys is spotted up on the strong side and then the other is spotted up on the weak side, it's going to just pull at the strings of defensive principles and scouting uh, reports and how you want to treat each one of those players in those different scenarios. 
So that level of opt that that optionality is just going to be such a weapon for them that most teams don't really have to that extent. And I mean, <laughs> looking at Bradley Bill, he's a player that does all of the stuff that you you see from Devin Booker, yeah. but just replaces that because Devin Booker, I imagine, is going to be the initiator of offense more than either other two. So now it's like, how do you replace what Devin Booker was bringing you off the ball? You insert Bradley Bill, who does all of that stuff at a different pace with a different type of skill set in terms of what he likes to get into in his bag. And now you've efficiently done that. You can also keep Devin Booker on the ball and not have to worry about issues there. And there's just so many, just so many options and versatility that this team has on the offensive side of the floor. Yeah, man, I, I agree. I think one thing that's been undersold about this this iteration of the uh, Suns team or the Suns era is for whatever reason, Devin Booker all has always gotten slighted to me for whatever reason. And obviously kind of like how the Suns were at the early, when he was a fucking teenager, damn near in early, <laughs> early twenties um, were discussed, but we can consider Devin Booker a two way guy, you know what I'm saying? So even if he comes off the ball, which I think he probably will a little bit more than I think people are imagining, he'll still be able to impact the game even that much more because you still got three three level scores that can pretty much get theirs anywhere on the floor. And when you do that, like you say, you really you really can't only do so much because you're basically picking whatever poison you want to have essentially. And at that point, you're gonna put so much pressure on teams just on a per night basis in the regular season, right? Like we're nowhere near playoff basketball. So we just pretty much talking about regular season basketball. It, it's going to be almost near impossible for a good majority of the teams to even match the firepower alone. And then with um, Frank Vogel, we know Frank has his issues. I think that we, especially Laker fans have with him and then prior uh, like issues? magic or, no or um, Indiana fans. But one thing no one will ever say about Frank is that his teams are not prepared, especially defensively. Mm -hmm. And so when you got a guy that can be a two-way guy on the perimeter that you can expect and you can pencil in for 25 to 28 a night in Devin Booker, and then you got a guy like KD, it's really like sky's the limit for what the offense will look like. So what do you anticipate the offense kind of like mirroring? What type of offense do you think they're going to run if it's just going to be like a free-flowing, I'm going to let y'all do y'all thing, and then we just going to high pick and roll it? Or do you think we gonna, they're going to work out a KD um, in like the elbow high post area or just completely just have it around the perimeter and then see about rim running with like, um, what's his name, Aiden, if he's end up not being moved? But I think that's a great question. And a lot of that still remains to be seen, but I think kind of lost in the acquisition of uh, Frank Vogel in replacement of Monty Williams is the fact that the Suns also brought back Kevin Young, who mm. was the assistant coach to uh, Monty, but mm. even more specifically, he was the basically the brains behind the style of offense that they ran. Okay. So I do think that obviously there's principles that Frank Vogel has in place that are going to tie into his um, his specialty, which is defense. So there might be a there might be adjustments to how they go about um, facilitating the offense, but I do think that it's going to be high octane. It's going to see a lot of pick and roll, but I think in addition to the pick and roll, the Suns are run just as many off ball uh, like handoff situations mm -hmm. as any other team, whether that be like Chicago action or Zoom action. Um, they just get into a lot of that stuff from the outer thirds and even from the middle third of the floor. Uh, pretty much more than any other team. And I think, again, like I mentioned earlier, with Bradley Beal being able to be there when Devin Booker is on the ball, that's just going to keep a constant uptick of that between those two as well as with Kevin Durant. And then you're going to see, obviously, a healthy blend of Kevin Durant getting his mid-post touches and low block touches and just uh, inverting the offense and uh, forcing the defense to play from the inside out, which most teams are not equipped to do principle-wise in this era of basketball. is more so to defend the three-point line, of course. So when you're able to invert the offense like that, that's going to change a lot of things for you. And then I think there's going to be a lot of um, just movement sets with players running off of screens. They have a handful of elite spot-up shooters, borderline elite spot-up shooters, Watanabe, Eric Gordon added to the mix. Uh, you add that into in addition to the big three, and that's just going to give you a lot of optionality and versatility, I think is the word of the, the podcast for the Suns. Um, that's just going to really keep them in the position of, doing a lot of different things that most teams don't have that 
that much depth in terms of options they can go to um, schematically. So mm -hmm. it's going to be a healthy blend of a lot of different things that are going to keep them in the position of dictating. Okay. Big KD, Kevin Durant. <laughs> this might be his last stop. I think it should be his last stop. Please let this be Kevin Durant's last stop as far as his uh, NBA franchises that he puts on jerseys for. But he was acquired, you know, midseason at the trade deadline last year. Um, played in about, what, 40, 40 plus games and then another 11 in the postseason, right? 29 points a game, regular season, postseason, 29 points a game. The minutes played in the postseason, though, are, you know, that would even scare the biggest KD fan at playing 42 minutes a night. Uh, but that's <laughs> what was needed uh, with zero bench in the playoffs. So, I mean, we we touched on KD. We talked about that this ship only goes as far as their 1A superstar uh, takes them. They have amazing supporting cast. The best, you know, arguably number two in the league in Devin Booker, him and Anthony Davis as far as being that Robin to a Batman. Um, but KD is definitely still that dude when healthy. When you saw him play last season, regular season playoffs, was there anything – that surprised you about Katie's game that you didn't really see before he was on a team that you were covering closely. And then I kind of just want to know how, how long is this championship window uh, with the three of Kevin Durant, Devin Booker and Bradley Beal? Uh, I'll answer that in reverse. I think they extended the window acquiring Bradley Beal for Chris Paul. I felt like this team had maybe one more season as like a true top three type of going into the season uh, contender. And I think with Bradley Bill in the mix, in addition to the ancillary pieces that we mentioned, I think that's extended the window. They signed a lot of those players outside of Bradley Bill this summer to two-year deals. So I think they're giving themselves like about a two-season window with this rendition to see if they need to make changes or if they can facilitate to get even better as things come, up, come along around the deadline for this upcoming season. But – uh, kind of looking at looking at the looking at the Suns um, with Kevin Durant, the, the the thing that really surprised me and just kind of watching his film and looking at the kind of finer details with everything, his preservation of energy. Like you talked about the minutes load, but it's not just like he's uh, ten toes down, going one hundred percent the whole time. He knows how to evenly distribute his game across multiple contexts to preserve his energy but also to keep his impact felt. So he talked about it in post game a handful of times in the postseason because a lot of Suns reporters were, oh, my God, he's playing 42, 43 minutes. He's 34. He can't do this. He can't do that. And Katie's like, yo, man, chill. Like, it's not like I'm out there for 42 minutes and I'm running 10,000 pick and roll. Like, half <laughs> right. of these possessions, bro, I'm sitting on the second side while Chris Paul is going pick and roll, empty, empty corner with DeAndre Ayton. I'm two passes away. Am I exerting any energy when I'm in the corner? No, but my impact right. is still felt because guess what? That low man, because it's empty corner with DeAndre Aiden and Chris Paul, which is arguably the best pick and roll outside of Jokic and Murray in the playoffs last season, you got to help over. If you help yeah. over, guess what? I'm in the corner wide open. So that's going to force another defender to come over. Now Devin Booker is wide open for Chris Paul, one of the better passes in NBA history, to make an easy read. You see the help go over to one player, you hit the other player timely, and now Devin Booker is knocking down wide open shots. And there's little scenarios like that over the course of a game where Kevin Durant doesn't have to exert any energy. Another example we could bring is when he does get his mid-post touches and low block touches, like Jody mentioned. Guess what? He's never going to see single covers there. So he's getting off the ball quick. He's just – he's not a decoy because he has the ball in his hands, but he's just a vacuum. He's sucking the defense in. That's going to pull defenders from the weak side across the helpline in addition to whoever is one pass away sending a double team. Now the defense is rotating, he gets the ball out of his hands, and he's exerted literally no energy, just making one read, getting it out quickly, and now that's offense. That's read and react offense in the playoffs. So just the preservation of energy. And then in addition to that, he scores so easily, dude. Like he, The one and two dribble and the zero dribble pull-ups that he takes in the playoffs, it's like you barely see him sweat. Like It's just, it's just he's a marvel on the offensive side. Right. So his preservation of energy – was just really what stood out to me and kind of watching this game. And then the last thing for KD is his defense. I think a lot of people don't understand how good of a defender he is in yep. terms of communication, being able to switch, the versatility, 
second side rim protection. Mm-hmm. Like all of those little things he does, he's just such a solid basketball player in general, not just on mm-hmm. the offensive side. Right. And that's one thing that I think because he's so good offensively, it's easy to just gloss over it because it's like, mm-hmm. God damn, this guy, like you said, one dribble pull up, two dribble pull up, get his stuff. Mm-hmm. Like it is is you're basically at his mercy unless you have one of those guys that can bother him or get under him. And, and even then you still at his mercy, the, the effectiveness might go down a small tick, but not anything that's going to really be, you know, something that like, Oh man, we do this and we're going to be good. We ain't got to right. worry about that. And it's just, it's almost like it's times three because now you got Booker and fucking Bradley Bill on the floor at the same <laughs> time, especially when it matters it's almost like you just, man, we almost damn near just got to pray these guys miss and we can rebound the ball, honestly. But then that's one thing where I feel like Aiden kind of comes in to kind of like where he should be able, assuming he stays on the roster, he should really be able to eat, get his off the glass, do the dishes, get these easy buckets. I know in the playoffs in the first round, I believe that y'all play, he was just getting so many um, top of the key, middle of the lane, pull up either floaters or jumpers. And they were like going in to where it's like, Aiden might get six or seven shots, seven, eight shots a game, but he going to mess around and make five to six to seven of them. Right. Those are going to be devastating points when you got guys that can just put up elite numbers on elite percentages. You know what I'm saying? So when you got to know you're getting a 28 from KD on a at least 50% from the field, <laughs> 25, easier, 26 man. from – from Devin Booker was shooting 80% from the fucking field for a vast majority of a playoff series, dog. Folks don't talk about as that. A, that as that a, as the primary massive. ball handler. As a primary ball handler. As a primary ball handler. So when you're talking about a big man that can easily run the floor, get the mm-hmm. shots off the glass, and then if with his six to eight attempts a game that he's probably going to get, if he's making a high percentage of those, you're basically just praying – for somebody to miss, you praying for one of your guys to have an amazing night. So it's really one of those situations where the the sons are going to have people begging for mercy, I feel like, honestly, um, as you really, really start to, like, look at how this year is going to turn out. But, like, moving on to, like, kind of, like, um, outside factors, like, how are you feeling about the sons' ownership change over? And then how that affects like broadcasting locally in the city. And how do you think like Suns fans feel about that going forward? Well, uh, starting with the ownership, Matt Ishbia, uh, I'm a Michigan State fan, uh, especially on the basketball side. So seeing Matt graduate to having ownership with a team is, it's really, it's really, it's, it's wild, man. It's wild. And just to see not just him get the position and the opportunity, but the way he's ran away with it. Within a few days of being hired, or it wasn't even official, but even within a few days of the news breaking, he goes and trades with Kevin Durant. And then in addition to that, he goes out in the next the next opportunity he gets, and he goes to get Bradley Bill. And he also went and got a bunch of ancillary pieces that that team needed after they got KD last season, like Terrence Ross, um, like players like that, like. This it's just a it's like a breath of fresh air for this franchise because y'all already talked about how it was with Sarver and company prior to him getting there. It was not it. It was not it. And even when the Suns made the finals, there was still this black crowd, this black cloud, excuse me, that was bringing a little bit of overcast to the sunshine that they had going on after they acquired Chris Paul. So to see them fully detach themselves from that situation and Matt Ishbia and everything that's come with it, I think it's been a revelation. It's been a long time coming for for Sun supporters of any capacity. And you can just feel the energy just be completely different when you see Ishbia walking around the sidelines pregame, ingratiating himself with players and fans and doing all of this stuff that a true owner is going to do. And not just talk about it, but actually walk that same talk that he's speaking. In his um, initial presser, he talked about nailing all these little things with um, showing love to the the, – maybe less spoken on or less thought of employees in the in the um, entire Suns organization. He's doing a bunch of different things like that. Just, again, just being 10 toes down about his word. And then you talk about the accessibility for fans in the local market. I think that was something else that was a little bit of a dark cloud. So having that, just being able to watch the games from home without having to have these third-party streaming apps, 
and racking up all these subscription fees and all of this stuff just to be able to turn your TV on. Okay, the game is on like it should be when you're literally within 100 miles of wherever the game is. Like it should that shouldn't be such a hassle. So the fact that it's it's, it's simplified. So, yeah, that's is an A plus knock it out the park. (laughs) That's really crazy to say in 2023, dog. Like that's insane. (laughs) To, to say that something that's they're passing out antennas, word. Jody. They, they yeah. will send you an antenna if you need it. Yeah. We get yeah. real yeah. back to the 90s with this, right? Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. huge, man. I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. that that kind of energy, and it feels like a little bit that you know, the Suns, and yes, they are not too far from, removed from a uh championship appearance, a finals appearance, excuse me. And it almost feels like when you play in GTA and you go and you find like a decent little SUV, right? It looks nice, but then you take it up to the uh to a little chop shop and then you run it through and you spend all your money on the upgrade, you bulletproof the car, you turn it metallic, you get the big turbo on the wheels, you get the bulletproof uh you know run flat tires and then you pull it back <laughs> out the lot. Same car but completely different car. That's what the Phoenix Suns feels like after getting Kevin Durant Ran after acquiring Bradley Beal, after swapping out a racist, misogynistic owner and bringing in an owner that is passing out antennas so the little folks can <laughs> still watch the Phoenix Suns. This is a this is a 180 for a team that was still uh, projecting to be a contender out west. So I know Suns fans are hyped. I know you're hyped to cover a team that has so much juice and energy behind it. And as we close out the show, we just got to ask, and we'll ask everybody that comes uh, on our uh, season preview series, what's the best case scenario for the Phoenix Suns? And then what is the worst case scenario for the Phoenix Suns this season? So the best case scenario is that Bradley Bill and Kevin Durant are as healthy as they have been in any season that they've had over the course of their career just because of the limited uses that they won't have to have the ball in their hands every possession and have all eyes on them for 40-plus minutes a game because they have Devin Booker plus each other that's out there with the other. So I think having them healthy and being able to just literally just be on the court, that's going to automatically be an advantage night in and night out regardless of who you're going against. So I think, like, if you're talking about the highest of highs, like 68, 65 wins, I don't think that's, I don't think that's outlandish if you get those players to be as healthy as they can possibly be this season. And obviously Doomsday is going to be one of those two players being hurt for a lot longer than them missing seven to 10 games over the course of the season. That's going to start uh, trickling into your depth, which you obviously did a good job uh, addressing, but those players are never going to be able to equate to, you feel me, what Kevin Durant and and Devin Booker and obviously Bradley Bill can do on a nightly basis. So that's the Doomsday scenario. And then they end up, like a middle of the pack team because of the injuries that may come up and they uh, end up like maybe fifth seed or fourth seed. That'll be doomsday in my opinion. I can't see them going lesser than that, even if they do sustain injuries. But that I think that ceiling is as daunting as anybody's ceiling in the NBA this season. They could get 65 and win a championship and lose like four games in the playoffs if things hit the way that they possibly can. So yeah, they're, they're they're cooking with, they're cooking with some grease right there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's one thing that's underrated about older stars coming to teams. I think it makes it easier for teams to buy in because they know we we're not just like we don't have these guys forever. This is not going to be the next thing for the next five to seven years. You know what I'm saying? Um, And now because I felt like that in like uh, 2020 with the Lakers, like I felt like the Mm. whole team's identity was like man we have to take this season super super serious we got to be 100 percent locked in and i think it showed um even throughout the season even after the break and they came back and um finished the season in orlando uh down in the bubble and so i think that's one thing that you guys got going for you in which i don't like and y'all gonna think i'm crazy but are we sure that kevin durant is the the lead dog and it's not devin booker on the team, like Brad Bill says, you, it's uh, Book's well, team. K, KD said it's Book's team too. I mean, he said that's I came what, to Phoenix to play with play with one. That's so, what I'm thinking. You know? Like I'm thinking Devin Booker is really the like the one, and then KD is like the one A, and then you got um, obviously Bill that's good enough to damn near be one C on any mm-hmm. given night. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it's really crazy, and it just really. It really gives the role players, it makes them that much better because they don't have as much exposure because you're not asking them to do so much, you know. Um, And, hey, hit a couple threes. Two threes from those guys can be devastating when you know you're getting damn near three to four from KD, 
three to four from from book, maybe one to three from beat. Like it's just gonna be, it's mm-hmm. it's gonna be a lot, man. So I, I know it's a great great time to be a Phoenix Suns fan, man. Um, what would you say the um, as a last question? What would you say the hype is going into this season compared to other Suns teams that have passed? Like I don't know, were you like? Fan of the Suns around the time with the uh, Mari, Steve Nash, uh, Mike D'Antoni era, or like how do people talk about this team going into the year compared to like seasons past teams? Uh, well, from my timeline, it seems like people are acknowledging the opportunity that again, health warranted. If mm-hmm. Bradley Bill and Kevin Durant can stay healthy this season, they're acknowledging that this could, at least on paper, that this is the best Suns iteration across the history of the team, but the opportunity to not just have it be on paper, but also break records in the process with that. And then obviously even more than any of that, get it done and knock down that door. You won two games in the championship two seasons ago. How do you get to four? How do you get to 16 wins in the playoffs? They got to 14 that that, that the last two Giannis said, absolutely not. And that dude is insane. Shout out to him. (laughs) Salute to him. But this is all that they're doing. They're addressing, okay, we got to 14. Can we get to 16? That's what you do when you ask somebody like KD. That's what you do when you ask somebody like Bradley Bill. So everybody's acknowledging, uh, at least from my timeline, again, that this is potentially the Suns' best opportunity ever to go and do what they, you know, what what almost came up two seasons ago. The hype is real. The target is squarely on the Phoenix Suns' back. I, I, you know, we'll hopefully talk to a Nuggets uh, reporter coming up here, but talk about, like, low-key summers, right? Hardly anyone's talking about the defending champion Nuggets, and maybe I'm sure that's an oversight. They're going to still be, you know, a top mm-hmm. dog out west and a perennial championship contender. But, man, with the the upgrades that the Suns have made over the past eight months, man, it's hard to deny who teams are going to be shooting for. And, man, God willing. We will get LeBron, KD, not once. Well, hell, I'm gonna just ask for once, and then we'll ask for twice. Because you nah, know, I want, I want all uh, four. I want four. Damn, I want four times, damn near. <laughs> Jody, I know, man. That's uh, right. We all do, That's bro. Right. But can we get one? Can we get one this season, and then build on top of that? Let's just take care of the first meeting here in the next few, in the first few weeks of the NBA season. But I think we had yeah, a question. I had a question for y'all. Uh, especially because y'all spent a few seasons with uh, Frank Vogel as your head coach. I was just wondering, just like checking his temperature wise, I have my personal observations from the outside in, but what were y'all like assessments of, uh, of Frank on the sideline and obviously uh, coaching a team that ultimately won the championship and maybe the adverse, most adverse stricken season. Uh, if both of y'all could give like one positive and one negative about him. Um. I would say the positive is even we had some really great defensive players that really kind of fit into yes. what uh, yes. Frank had when you talk about a 2020 LeBron, a 2020 AD, a 2020, um, what's his name? Um, Caruso. Caruso, yeah. KCP. Um, KCP. Wes Matthews. West Matthews. <laughs> You're talking about, uh, what's the what's the yeah. other dude name? Um, Lyskin. Um you that played for eight? the, no, that played for the Spurs and the um and the uh, Raptors. Oh, Danny um, Green, Danny Green. Oh, yeah, like Danny. we had yeah, so yeah, yeah. many guys that were elite defensively, but I always liked that they were always prepared. Um, mm. but I guess my own. So that was be the good thing because preparation really knocks out a lot of issues, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, but my only thing was that Vogel was, and this is probably an issue with a lot of veteran coaches. Vogel was slow to change when it was clear that things needed to change. Like Vogel should have played Austin Reeves way more than he did. Um, And obviously Austin was young. You don't necessarily know what he would end up turning out to be, but I think we would have been able to get a better uh, outcome of the year. Had we got Austin more burn in Frank's last year, pretty much. Um, But that would be mine too. He was always prepared, but still kind of stubborn um, to change. Yeah, but do you I, feel I, like that was? Do you feel like that was more so with younger players, or was that just with like changing lineups within the rotation too, and schemes and stuff like that? Uh, I think I think it's actually some of both of that. I think it's hard for because okay. Frank Vogel comes from a different era in the NBA where sure. you know it's really a veterans uh, league. But then also mm-hmm. he wasn't 
he wasn't in he wasn't placed in the in the best position to succeed if i'm just being honest based on how mm-hmm. everything turns out mm-hmm. so it's kind of like tough to completely gauge but i think frank vogel is a good coach just generally speaking i think you could he's proven that he can win with average to good players he can win with high end talent so when you know you got a coach that's proven he can win you can't really ask for much more than that honestly gotcha gotcha yeah. I, I think for me, right, like Frank Vogel won a championship his first year coaching the Lakers with all the adversity that the team endured. That takes a special person to try to navigate all of that, right? Um, mm-hmm. So I'm appreciative for him. I'm appreciative that defense to offense basketball really reigned supreme in his years of coaching and leading the Lakers, right? You could tell what style of coach he was. And that's one thing, right, across any sport. I need to see your signature on this team. And if I don't, what the hell are you here for, right? Steve, you know that very well with our Bears right now, man. We got a defensive head coach and our defense sucks. So I'm wondering what the hell is he doing employed? So um, I, I just think with with Frank, he was – it, what frustrated me, right, he was a little bit more veteran heavy than I would have liked. Jody touched on it. Like, I think overall, as long as Frank has the horses that he feels comfortable putting out there from a defensive perspective of basketball, he's going to be a successful head coach. If he has to turn non-defensive minded players into defensive minded players, you might see a slower, you know, um, a slower turn up to the season as far as what he's good at and how the team shows that from a night to night basis. The Lakers almost felt like they took to his identity almost at day one, right? They were top of the league in transition points, top of the league in defensive rating, fast break points. And it wasn't because the Lakers were a fast basketball team. It's just, they were Mm -hmm. so menacing on the defensive end. It led to those transition outlet passes Mm -hmm. that were easy Mm -hmm. buckets. So I think that Frank, he has the players on the offensive end of the court to be a very successful basketball team scoring the points. I'm a little curious how that's going to translate with his identity on the defensive end. Because if you get a high scoring offensive team um, that Frank Vogel's coaching, but they're also giving up just as many points or relatively just as much, I'm going to have a couple questions on how that's going to translate to playoff success, right? Because then it feels mm-hmm. like it's a personnel thing, not really a scheme thing, since his scheme has shown, proven to be successful his entire coaching career. So mm-hmm. I'm a big Frank Frankie Smokes fan, man. His rotations drove us a little crazy. He played his favorites, mm-hmm. but who doesn't, right? So. Um, <laughs> It should be fun. You you guys are in good hands, and I know we'll see the Phoenix Suns multiple times down the road in the playoffs. But and I think the stars are going to buy into Frank. Like I think when mm-hmm. you got like LeBron and AD bought in immediately, rest of the team follow suit. KD and Book and Bill, I think, will buy in, and everybody else is just going to fall in line. And that's really, really the the whole thing right there. As long as they buy in, you should be good money. Yeah, KD already uh, mentioned that, well, Frank mentioned his first conversation with KD was about all defense. He said he's excited to fly around on the defensive side and start figuring out language and terminology and principles and all of that stuff. So I think the buy-in is already starting to be generated. Mm-hmm. And the only weakness or issue that I think they'll have to solve is what's their ceiling defensively? Like y'all mentioned, the Lakers were littered with defensive talents. And a lot of those talents came at the point of attacking on the wing. The Suns have multiple wing defenders, but that point of attack thing is still, I'm not going to say a question mark, but how good can it be when Frank likes to play an aggressive style of defense? You don't have a Caruso on this team that you're going to be playing in the waning moments of a game seven. So how much impact does that have not having that addressed directly? It's going to remain to be seen. I think there's ways to get around that, but that's going to be something that I'm going to have my eye on because, again, there's only so many Caruso's in the NBA as it is. Right. So the fact that you don't have one on your roster and you have a coach that I'm not going to say leans on that style of defense at the point of attack, but is a it's as much of an asset as anything, I'm going to be curious to see. And I know Devin Booker can get active at the point of attack, but you don't necessarily want your – potential no, number one, here. you feel me? Mm-hmm. Especially in the playoffs, you don't want him running around 80 screens, running around guarding Steph Curry or Jamal Murray. So it's going to be interesting to see how they go about navigating that. But I do think that Frank is a, a about as good of a coach as you could find for this rendition of the Suns. 
I mean, Last I heard campaign is available. I don't know if that yeah, interests yeah, you guys. Campaign. Or not. Friend of the show campaign. <laughs> yeah, he's uh Stace and Guru were quick to, to repost that <laughs> conversation that Cam slides into the space and is talking shit about the Lakers. How funny how time always comes back around. Um, wait, last point I wanted to say about Frankie Smokes before we get you out of here, uh, Steve. We got – we saw Frank kind of instill a funnel all dynamic guards into the post, funnel yep. them to the big men that would cause havoc, right? It wasn't mm – -hmm just ad it was ad and dwight and Javin, and, right and mm -hmm. like that was those are trees that like playing defense right like during mm -hmm. that time that was the lakers real identity pesky perimeter defenders but at the end of the day we're gonna let you get into that mid post because we have two to three seven footers at any point in time that could cause havoc and disrupt shots so i think a lot of it is on Aiton's shoulders, right? He's going to get a lot of action in there, in the post. So I'm interested to see how he adjusts and he kind of carries that responsibility because if he turns into a, you know, a foul merchant, right, which he has been prone to get into a little bit of foul trouble over the years, um, that, that's not going to be good for the whole defensive philosophy that, that Frank Vogel has. So I don't think Yusuf Nurkic is for damn sure not the answer, but um, I think Miles Turner would be a nice little uh, uh, upgrade from, from that. I hope that you guys don't get Miles Turner for the record. I yeah, that'd be nasty. Yeah, actually, I don't hope that shit either. So, uh, <laughs> Stephen, bro, we got to get you going. Uh, appreciate sure. you sliding through man like we said we're excited to have you as an official friend of the show can't wait to have you back on but uh let the late night lake show family know where they can follow you and your good content yeah i'm gonna just i'm doing a lot so i'm gonna just go ahead and say you can follow me on twitter at stay true s.3 s-t-a-y-t-r-u-e-s-d-o-t -E and the number three at the end and on that in my in my profile is my um my link tree and that's where you can literally find all my stuff that I've been doing since college all the way up until now. So, um, so yeah, that's where you can find me at. I'm always willing to talk hoop if you're willing to speak on it from an unbiased perspective. Uh, I will always engage in that. But if you come in with an agenda, I will not <laughs> entertain it. So I'll go ahead and give you a heads up on that. No, I love talking hoop, though. So if you genuinely want to talk it, I'm with it. Yep. No stands hop into uh into Steven's <laughs> mentions, man. He just not please no not here for it, <laughs> appreciate you sliding through, man. We'll talk to you next time. Appreciate y'all, man.